Tinakoto, Tinakoto, Tinakoto Katoa, no mai, haere mai. Good afternoon and welcome to the 25th annual New Zealand Law Foundation Ethel Benjamin Commemorative Address. My name is Natalia Darek and it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you here on behalf of the Otago Women's Law Society. We are thrilled to be hosting this address today given last year's unfortunate cancellation. In particular, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to members of the Judiciary, King's Council, the Pro Vice Chancellor, the Dean of Law, former address speakers, OWL's founding and life members, the Mayor, and to our honoured guests, Judge Coral Shaw and her husband, Peter. Um, a big hello and welcome to those also joining us by live stream. A few housekeeping matters. No smoking. <laughs> in the event of a fire, of fire alarms activating, uh, which is in brackets, a high-pitched alarm, uh, please clear the auditorium and evacuate the building via the main staircase to the front exit. There's also a, um, an exit there. And toilets are located behind the auditorium. No food or drinks are to be consumed in here. Um, before I hand you over to this year's speaker, a few quick words on the purpose of the Ethel Benjamin Address. Ours has hosted this address for the last 24 years. We do this each year to honour Ethel's legacy, to celebrate the perseverance of a woman who believed in justice and education, had faith in equality, who worked hard despite the odds, and went on to serve those she thought the profession was not serving well. In 1897, Ethel began, became New Zealand's very first female lawyer. 125 years down the road, here we are, 8,500 female lawyers, about 54% of the profession. When choosing a speaker for the Ethel Benjamin Address, we look for women who have done incredible things. There is no shortage of talented women in the New Zealand legal profession. But more than that, we look for women that embody the spirit of Ethel, that belief in justice, equality and community. As you will no doubt glean, Judge Coral Shaw is firmly in that category. A 2019 article described her as the woman who just won't quit. This being a nod to her three unsuccessful attempts at retiring, following an illustrious career, first as a teacher and then a lawyer. Following her appointment to the district court, then employment court bench, Judge Shaw spent seven years at the United Nations Dispute Tribunal before returning home and conducting a number of reviews. Judge Shaw was director of the International Association of Women Judges for over 10 years. Three years ago, Judge Shaw was appointed as the Chair of the Royal Commission into Historical Abuse in State Care and in the Care of Faith-Based Institutions. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Judge Shaw. Thank you, Natalia. In a mana, in a reo, in a hoe far. Rauranga tirama, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. E mihi ana ki te mana whenua o tēne rohe, tēnā koutou. E mihi ana ki te rōpū roia wahine o, o tākou, tēnā koutou me te karanga ki a kōrerou au i tēnei rā. And e mihi ana ki a koutou ko tai mai ki a, a tīnana, E ma takitaki hoki, ma te ipurangi, tēnā koutou, kia ora koutou katoa. I acknowledge the mana whenua, greetings to them. I acknowledge uh, the Otago Women's Law Society, who have referred to themselves as our feathered friends. <laughs> thank you so much for your invitation to give this address today, and thank you for your hospitality. So far it has been quite overwhelming to be received with such generosity and friendliness. And to everybody who's come along today or who are watching on the live stream, greetings to you all. The invitation from Owls to give this Ethel Benjamin address came as such a surprise that I said yes without thinking. <laughs> and then having registered the enormity of the significance of the event, I instantly regretted it. Um, a review of the impressive speeches by my predecessors uh, made things much worse. Uh, the very first by Zame Sylvia Cartwright in 2007 set a really high bar 
which has been maintained by those who have followed her, which left me, a pragmatist rather than an academic, rather intimidated. But the powerful and inspiring example of Ethel Benjamin, who features there with her sweet face, and the dedication of Owls to the celebration of her memory brought me down to earth. Uh, she was a woman who not only seized th what opportunities came her way, but also created her own. It's worth repeating for the record and for the next generation some of her achievements. She was not only New Zealand's first woman lawyer, but in 1897, the first in the British Empire to appear as counsel in court. She excelled academically. Her law practice thrived in the face of serious barriers placed in her way by the then Otago District Law Society. She founded the New Zealand Society for the Protection of Women and Children. But she also managed a restaurant, happily named the Cherry Tea Rooms, and was a property speculator. When she and her husband moved to England in 1908, as a woman, she was unable to practice, but managed a bank in Sheffield instead. She was tragically killed in a motor accident in 1943. I wish I knew her. I want to know what drove her, against all odds, to study law and practice it. I would love to have talked about her wide interests, both personal and professional. One of the great pities is that her personal papers no longer exist. So while we have the achievements and some formal records, we have to infer or even guess at what Ethel was like as a person. What I know for certain is that she was tenacious. She took hold of the chances that came her way. She amassed a wealth of experiences in the law and in business. But I firmly believe that lawyers who come to the law with full and rich past experiences or who open themselves to a varied life while in practice can better serve their clients and society at large. I have been most fortunate to have had rich experiences both before I became a lawyer and since. In my journey in the law, I have been supported, mentored and encouraged by good, clever and kind lawyers and by my friends and family and I'm very grateful for the variety and breadth of opportunities that I've had. In my present role as the Chair of the Royal Commission into Abuse and Care, I have had to draw on all of these, both personal and professional, for this is a job like no other, and it has stretched me like no other. It has affected me profoundly, both personally and professionally. It has opened my eyes to a previously unspoken and shameful history of cruel abuse and neglect of the most vulnerable in our society. It has caused me to reflect long and hard on what it truly means to be a responsible citizen of Aotearoa New Zealand. I will start with the voice of one of the survivors who has shared their account with the Royal Commission but who wishes to remain anonymous. This person said, it seems that abuse and care don't fit together. Yet here we are. I ask that everyone in New Zealand open their hearts to the voices of those who share. Realise that our voices are valid, real and raw. We are sharing our valid experiences. My plea is that our experiences be validated and listened to. When we do, we can honour the experience and soon alleviate the pain. Much of the work of this Royal Commission is dedicated to listening to survivors and giving them the voice they have lacked for so long. The Commission's reports are fundamentally based on their accounts and our recommendations are and will be designed to change the way New Zealand Aotearoa cares. So in this address, I will give you some background about royal commissions 
and something of the history that led to this one. I will then take you through the Law Commission, of how the Commission is working, and end with some personal reflections. So to begin, what is a Royal Commission? There are many forms of inquiry that are possible under a range of statutes, but for present purposes, I'll concentrate on one form, the Royal Commission. It's not easy to draw a clear line about what informs the decision by a government whether to set up an inquiry as opposed to a Royal Commission of Inquiry. In its report on inquiries in 2007, the, the Law Commission even questioned if there was any need to continue with the distinction. The Inquiries Act that followed some time after the Law Commission's report says that a Royal Commission is established under the Royal Prerogative, in contrast to inquiries which are established by Royal Order and Council. However, both are public inquiries and share the same duties, powers and immunities and privileges. In the end, it seems that the Royal Commission should be reserved for the most serious matters of public importance. What this amounts to is ultimately for the government of the day to weigh and determine. So there are many different reasons for an inquiry, and they include to establish facts, to learn from events, uh, to be at a cathartic or therapeutic exposure, for reassurance, for rebuilding confidence after a major failure, for accountability, for blame and retribution. And there are political considerations such as to show that something is being done about a serious matter and also for policy development. So since uh, 1976, there have been about 10 royal commissions covering such diverse topics as policy-driven uh, issues such as contraception, sterilisation and abortion, uh, electoral reform, social policy, nuclear power generations, the courts and genetic modification. Some royal commissions have inquired into conduct, such as the Royal Commission on the Circumstances of the Conviction of Arthur um, Alan Thomas. Some have been concerned with drug trafficking, and some have dealt with both the conduct and the policy matters, such as the Air New Zealand crash into uh, Erebus, uh, the mine explosion and deaths at Pike River, and the Christchurch mosque attack. The common feature I have concluded about these Royal Commissions of Inquiry into Conduct is a catastrophic event. The duration of these previous Royal Commissions ranged from 14 to 22 months. Only a couple took a shorter time than they originally planned. So what makes a good Commission of Inquiry? How will we know if it's worked, if it was worthwhile? Well, ultimately, the answers to these questions is a matter for history, and history shows that the political reasons for setting up a royal commission are not always matched by the extent to which the recommendations of the inquiry are implemented. It's been said of inquiries in Britain that, quote, if public inquiries are to be known by their fruits, and if their proper fruits are reforms and improvements in law and practice, there's probably not a great deal to be said for them. Well, I believe that pessimistic view came from the realisation that responses by successive governments to the implementation of recommendations of, by Royal Commissions had been at best patchy. In New Zealand, the Law Commission recommended there was a need for inquiry reports to be tabled in the House of Representatives and to ensure that there was well-defined and clear responsibility for releasing reports and responding to recommendations. And that inquiry was only added into the Inquiries Act in 2013. And this hopefully is something of an answer to what has been referred to often as institutional amnesia. That act also clarified and made explicit some previously uncertain common law principles for the fundamentals of a public inquiry. Notably, for the first time, the express requirement that an inquiry must act independently, impartially, and fairly. 
It also clarified the limits to the powers to determine civil, criminal or disciplinary liability of any person. So these legislated standards and boundaries should engender some institutional and public confidence in the outcomes. Several royal commissions in New Zealand have resulted in significant government responses to catastrophic events. Of the many examples, I single out the 1988 Cartwright inquiry concerning the treatment of cervical cancer at National Women's Hospital, and that resulted in the establishment of an ethics committees, the Health Information Privacy Code, and the Office of the Health and Disability Commissioner. And it also led, happily, uh, to the establishment of the National Cervical Screening Programme. The Royal Commission on the Pike River coal mine tragedy led to major changes to health and safety legislation and the setting up of WorkSafe New Zealand. And these changes were accepted by the public and have become part of our le legislative fabric. So I believe that apart from a considered response by the government of the day that I've been referring to, an important driver of the outcomes of an inquiry is likely to be the extent to which the public engages with and is concerned enough about the issues raised in the report to require the politicians to make changes. The fact that the reports of commissions of inquiry must be tabled in Parliament after presentation to the Governor-General <coughs> means that the public is now guaranteed at least formal access to them and that they are subject to public scrutiny and debate. I am hopeful that if an inquiry is transparent and operates in public view as much as possible, and if it engages not just with those with a vested interest in the subject matter, but with the public as a whole, then there is a good chance that the public will look for and even demand change. But that is for later. So I move to the history of the Royal Commission into Abuse and Care. If I can just add that it is a remarkable, in my view, a remarkable history. The Royal Commission has not yet delivered its final report because that is due next year in mid-2023. So I am constrained in what I can say about our current findings and our proposed recommendations. But so far we have presented two interim reports and I draw mostly on those for what is to follow. I'll also refer to unchallenged evidence given by survivors at public hearings. But this Royal Commission is based on a rich, hearing, a rich history which predates its establishment by many years. From the earliest days of colonisation in Aotearoa, New Zealand, both the state and faith-based institutions have found it necessary to provide out-of-home care for troubled or disadvantaged children and for young people and for vulnerable adults such as those with a disability, the mentally ill and the deaf. And one's just one example, a very early one, is the industrial schools established in 1896 for, quote, neglected and criminal children. And I'm sure Ethel probably knew something about that. Based on admittedly limited and poor quality historical data, which of itself is a disgrace that it is so limited and so poor, we have estimated that between 1950 and 1999, 650,000 people went through care institutions covered in the inquiry's terms of reference. And up to about 250,000 may have been abused. These people were from all parts of New Zealand's social fabric and of all ages and cultures. However, people from three particular groups have been taken into care in numbers hugely disproportionate to their actual population. And those three cohorts, those three groups of people are Māori, of the Pacific, and those with disabilities. Institutional or out-of-home care was not part of pre-colonised Māori society. 
yet Māori have been and continue to be overrepresented amongst those taken into care. At times, up to 80% of the children in particular state institutions, such as the Owairaka Boys' Home in Auckland, were described as Polynesian, mainly Māori. It is clear that the discriminatory attitudes of officials, members of the police and the public contributed to this overrepresentation. To this day, the number of Māori in care is still disproportionate to the Māori population, and this extends to the number of children who are, as a result, abused in care. And many Māori in care today are the children, the tamariki, of those previously taken into care. An example, Daniel Koo, a person who gave evidence at one of our hearings. He was removed from his grandmother's care in rural North Island and separated from his twins, his other siblings and his whole culture. He was subjected to unspeakable sexual, physical and emotional abuse at the hands of the state and the Brothers of St John of God at Maryland School for Children in Christchurch and at the Child and Adolescent Unit at Lake Ellis Psychiatric Hospital. He told us, All I'm thinking is, why are the people picking on the peepees? When I was a young child, they were damaging us right up to the age of 14. And from the age of 14, I was still being picked on by the system. As an adult, Daniel has had his own children taken from him, and in spite of his best efforts, including multiple parenting courses, he has had to wait till his son was 17 before he could be reunited with him. And so it is that in the name of care, Māori have been alienated in large numbers and across generations from their history, their values, their whenua, tikanga and cultural connections. Pacific people have also been underrepresented in care, and that continues, uh, sorry, overrepresented in care, and that continues today. A large proportion of people with disabilities and other vulnerable adults have not only experienced some form of care during their lives, but are also likely to be overrepresented amongst those who've suffered from abuse and neglect. It can take decades for a victim of abuse to gather sufficient insight and strength to confront what they have been through, let alone to report the abuse and to seek redress for the harm they have suffered. And survivors suffer, uh, face significant barriers when disclosing their abuse, not the least of which is disbelief, uh, shame, lack of inaccessible complaints processes, and above all, as I said, shame, whakama. Somehow survivors believe it was their fault that they were abused. However, in spite of these formidable barriers, by the late 1990s, some survivors began to bring claims in the High Court, seeking redress from both the state and faith-based institutions for what they had gone through while they were in care. In the early 2000s, with a steadily growing number of court claims and a potential liability of hundreds of millions of dollars looming, the state and the churches were forced to react. Between January 2004 and August 2015, 2,513 people made claims either in court or directly against the Ministry of Social Development alone. Many more were claiming against the Ministries of Health and Education as well as individual churches. But as we found in our report on redress called He Pura Pura Ora He Mara Tipu, despite harrowing accounts and often obvious signs of physical, emotional or psychological damage, many survivors had their efforts to obtain redress rejected 
time and time again. In short, in statements of defence, the Crown refused to acknowledge the harm it had done to survivors, despite the supporting evidence on record. It resisted their claims using all available legal defences, such as the Limitations Act, resulting in years of delay before these survivors could make any progress on their claims. The churches also initially took a legalistic view, relying on their insurers to resist or reduce the claims. But eventually, the state and the churches set up alternative forms of redress in an attempt to grapple with the large number of claims. But we have found that in doing this, they took no account of Māori or Pacific culture, values and tikanga, and nor were the processes developed uh, uh, fair or consistent. Redress was unobtainable for most deaf people and those with disabilities. We found that these schemes have often caused further harm to people, already deeply harmed by the organisations they were seeking redress from. Survivors are told currently, that is today, that their claims to the Ministry of Social Development will take five years to resolve, unless a fast-track process for less monetary redress is chosen. So in spite of being brought face to face with the abuses endured and the impact on those survivors, the agencies and institutions were slow to take preventative action and make systemic change to prevent abuse happening again, something that all survivors overwhelmingly hope for. So it's no wonder that survivors faced with these barriers looked for other avenues to obtain justice, including the Human Rights Commission and eventually the United Nations. Private individuals and advocacy groups began to pressure governments and the opposition to set up an independent inquiry into abuse and care. In 2009, the UN Committee Against Torture raised concerns about how New Zealand handled historic abuse claims after the Citizens Commission on Human Rights brought, its, brought to its attention cases such as that of Paul Zentfeld, a survivor of Lake Alice Child and Adolescent Unit in the 1970s. In 2011, the then Chief Human Rights Commissioner, Rosalind Noonan, produced a draft report entitled the review of the state response to historic claims of abuse and mistreatment suffered while under the care of the state. This report, which was never published, recommended an independent inquiry. Remember, this was 2011. Noonan did not think that the Ministry of Social Development was appropriately impartial to conduct such an inquiry. According to her, in evidence uh, to the Royal Commission, the response by the Crown was that international human rights standards did not require an independent process, only that it be impartial, and that there were no systemic issues arising from the claims of abuse which merited independent investigation. It's important at this stage to acknowledge the tenacious, brave people who advocated for an inquiry in the face of stiff resistance. People like Rosalind Noonan, who continued her crusade far beyond her professional responsibilities. Dr Oliver Sutherland, the Citizens Commission on Human Rights, survivors, academics and investigative journalists. On behalf of survivors, lawyers such as Grant Cameron, Sonia Cooper and Amanda Hill at Cooper Legal continued to press claims that others would have abandoned as hopeless. They did this at their own personal cost and shamefully endured ridicule and criticism of their efforts from within the legal profession, including, I'm sad to say, from some judges. Another brave and tenacious person was the remarkable Dame Carolyn Henwood, who had chaired a listening service for survivors set up by the government. 
In her 2015 report, for class final report, entitled Some Memories Never Fade, she concluded that much of the abuse was preventable. If jobs had been conducted properly and proper systems had been in place. Participants told, told her that they wanted systemic change and public acknowledgement of the wrongs of the past. She recommended a public statement by the government acknowledging the wrongs of the past, but she didn't call for an inquiry at that time. But in response, Social Development Minister of the time, Anne Tolley, stated that there would be no universal apology as there was no evidence that abuse of children in state care was systemic and that an independent inquiry would re-traumatise victims. The Prime Minister of the time, Bill English, said that a formal inquiry was not needed as the extent of the problem was, quote, pretty well known. An inquiry would take little, make little difference to children now in state care but would divert much needed resources away. The then Judge Henwood told the Royal Commission that the government response to her report was quite devastating and had prompted her to publicly support an inquiry. She also stated firmly that evidence of systemic failings that led to abuse would not be found unless the state was prepared to look. So the pressure on the government was mounting. In 2017, the United Nations Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination called for an independent commission of inquiry into the abuse of children and adults with disabilities in state care in New Zealand. And then in July 2017, 20, two, sorry, 200 people, including victims of violence and abuse in state care, gathered on the steps of Parliament to send a message. They shared harrowing stories of mistreatment before handing over a 5,300 named petition and the Human Rights Commission's E Kore Anō open letter signed by 10,000 New Zealanders calling for an independent inquiry and a universal apology. Finally, following the 2017 general election, the establishment of the Royal Commission into Historic Abuse and State Care was on the first 100 days agenda for the incoming Labour government, and it came into being on the 31st of January 2018. So a long journey. So finally, the abuse and neglect of people in care had been acknowledged by, the gov by a government and action was taken to address it with a Royal Commission of Inquiry. Because this was a catastrophe that justified such a serious step. But it wasn't a single or isolated event, but a decades-long intergenerational catastrophe that impacted survivors as long as they lived as well as their Fano, hapu and iwi. And it also has pernicious impacts on the whole of our society. From the start, this was no ordinary inquiry. For the first time, a chair of a Royal Commission, Sir Anand Satinand, was asked to consult on and recommend refinements to its own draft terms of reference. And this decision reflected the recognition that to build trust and confidence amongst survivors, their whānau, their communities, the terms of reference needed to be developed independently of the state agencies under whose care the people suffered the abuse and neglect. So Sir so Anand consulted with a wide range of survivors and stakeholders and the general public. And as a result of his report in November 2018, the terms of reference were expanded to make this Royal Commission the most comprehensive of such inquiries internationally. It covers not just the abuse, but the neglect of children, young persons and vulnerable adults who were in care between 1950 and 1999. The scope was widened as a result of consultation 
to include those in the care of faith-based institutions as well as the state. And most importantly during cons consultation, the terms of reference, or following consultation, the terms of reference require that the inquiry is underpinned by Te Tiriti or Waitangi and must partner with Māori throughout the inquiry process. It must give appropriate recognition to Māori interests and to Pacific peoples. A key focus is abuse of vulnerable adults. And in summary, the state care settings that can be investigated are very wide, and they include social welfare settings such as care and protection, youth justice residences, foster care and adoption placements, borstals or other similar facilities, health and disability settings such as psychiatric hospitals, residential and non-residential institutions with people with, with disabilities, all educational settings such as early childhood, primary, intermediate, secondary state schools, including boarding schools and residential special schools. And finally, re transitional and law enforcement settings, such as police cells, police custody, court cells, to cover abuse that was occurred on the way to, between, or in or out of state care facilities or settings. And the responsibility of the inquiry is to investigate the care provided by faith institutions who were also assumed responsibility of individuals, including faith-based schools, residential and non-residential. The Commission was asked to look not only at this history and the systemic reasons for the abuse and neglect that had happened in these settings, but the impacts of the abuse and to make recommendations as to the future of care in this country. And so it was that the largest and most long-running and expensive inquiry in New Zealand's history came into being. Its formal title is the Royal Commission into Historical Abuse in State Care and in the Care of Faith-Based Institutions. It is a multi-million budget and a lifespan of five years, three years longer than any other Royal Commission. And we began work in earnest in January 2019. At the same time as the Royal Commission was established, the Cabinet established a Crown Response Unit to lead and coordinate the Crown's response to the Royal Commission. And in response to orders that I as Chair make under the Inquiries Act, this unit answers questions we pose and provides Crown records, some going back to colonial times. Over a million such documents have been disclosed to the inquiry so far. And the unit also provides other information such as timelines and research papers. Similarly, the Catholic Church has a response unit to Rupu Totoko to coordinate the responses of the many parts of that church. Other faith-based institutions have retained law firms and council to represent their interests at public hearings as appropriate. So how is the Commission working and where are we heading? Structurally, the Commission comprises a chair and four commissioners. Sir Anand gave two years of valuable service conducting the consultation and once the rest of the commissioners were in place at the end of 2018, overseeing the establishment of the commission, uh, he then left to become the Chancellor of Waikato University, and I replaced him as chair. Our commissioners are Ali Muamua Sandra Ilofevai, who I'm delighted has come to join us today, uh, Dr Andrew Erwiti, Paul Gibson and Julia Stenson. Council Assist are Simon Mount KC. Again, I'm delighted he has taken the trouble to come from Auckland today. Uh, and Karen Beaton KC from Christchurch. And they are supported by a number of barristers who come in and out as required to assist with investigations, public hearings and report writing. Our Secretariat, which oversees the administration and operations of the inquiry, uh, uh, was headed by Mervyn Singham, who then left to become the chief executive of the new Ministry for Ethnic Communities, and was replaced last year by Helen Portkey, who manages the staff, 
the organisational systems and process, processes to support our operating model, including large numbers of solicitors, researchers, policy analysts and investigators, uh, wellbeing support people and engagement experts, as well as, the, of course, the inevitable administration of human resources, health and safety, governance, communications. And at times, the staff have numbered up to 200. We are acutely conscious that this is an independent inquiry, committed to working transparently and in public wherever possible. We are committed to taking a human rights approach to ensure that the reporting of the inquiry, including findings, expressions of views and recommendations, are consistent with and promote compliance with international and domestic human rights law and policy to the greatest extent possible. And of course, at the centre of this is Te Tiriti or Waitangi, which, as I have said, underpins the entire inquiry. One part of our work that has remained constant is the survivor-centred approach to gathering our information and evidence. You might ask if this smacks of predetermination. However, the terms of reference recognise and state that abuse has occurred and that it has had lasting impacts. And it expressly requires us to focus on victims and survivors. Our task is to, con is to consider these structural, systemic or practical factors that caused or contributed to this abuse and its impacts. At the heart of the survivor-centred approach is the private session, where a commissioner or an experienced kaitaka waianga sits down with a survivor face-to-face -face, or a group of survivors and whanau to listen and record their experiences while they were in care, to hear about the impact on their lives and their ideas about what needs to change. We work in a trauma-informed, mana-enhancing way, wherever we can. These encounters give us privileged access to the heart-rending, powerful and deeply shocking accounts which inform our investigations, our findings, reports and recommendations. This process also has a therapeutic value for at least some of the survivors who, despite the pain of reliving their abuse, feel compelled to give us their account. Other survivors prefer to give their accounts in writing or through a third person, and all are welcome. In almost all cases, they tell us that the reasons for doing this is to stop it ever happening again to future generations. You will see that to date, our reports have contained summaries of some of these accounts. All are being archived so they can never be lost. Our wellbeing persons, the services provide as much support as a survivor needs to help prepare, go through, and then to recover from these sessions. And I have to say that wellbeing extends to the commissioners and others who have to listen to them as well. So these accounts are analysed to find facts, patterns, and to identify abusive settings and systems. And, so, and as are the hundreds of documents we have and continue to receive. Our research and policy team plays a vital role in the analysis, conducting or commissioning research papers and advising on policy as we navigate the huge task of writing reports and formulating recommendations for change. Public hearings are an important part of our work. COVID permitting, these hearings have been open to the general public and are live streamed. They're also able to be watched on our website at any time. All but three of the hearings have taken place in a purpose-built hearing space in Newmarket, Auckland, and we've held 13 hearings the final one starts in a couple of weeks in mid-October. The most recent hearing saw 14 chief executives and other executive officers from government departments, as well as the Ombudsman, questioned over two weeks about the historic abuse that took place and their plans for the future. Almost all of those chief executives made fulsome acknowledgements of what had been alleged by survivors. 
We have received some criticism from some quarters that the public hearings are too legalistic and too daunting for survivors. We acknowledge that criticism and have taken it into account in our planning. There are some fine balances to be struck and judgment is necessary about who should be called. But it is important that the public is aware of and has confidence in what we're doing and that it can participate. The public needs to be able to see and assess for itself the soundness and independence of our work. It's also vital that individuals and institutions can be held to account and that the evidence becomes a matter of public record. Above all, it is essential that Aotearoa New Zealand opens its ears to listen, to learn and acknowledge not only this dark part of our history, but also the reality of many who are still in care and still suffer from the impacts of the abuse. And to that extent, I am convinced that relatively formal hearings are necessary. But the hearings are not adversarial. Although all the state and faith-based parties are represented by legal counsel, the hearings are run by the Commission's counsel assist, who, with the commissioners, decide which witnesses will be called. These counsel assists conduct virtually all of the questioning. Some survivors really want to give evidence in public, however painful. Others want nothing to do with them, and we respect their right to choose. We provide well-being to anyone impacted by the hearings, particularly but not exclusively survivors. Commissioners, lawyers, staff and other witnesses are not immune from the trauma caused by hearing this evidence. To make hearings as authentically, or culturally authentic and as accessible as possible, particularly for our Pacific and our Māori um, people, Two hearings were held in venues away from our hearing room. In 2021, we held the Pacific hearing called To Lo, Our Voices, Our Pacific Voices, and it was held in the Fale of Samoa in Mangere in Auckland. The Pacific community attended in large numbers and embraced the hearings, which were infused with Pacific protocol and practices. Our tikanga-based Māori hearing was held in April 2022 at Orakei Marae in Auckland with the blessing of Ngāti Whātua, although COVID settings at that time meant the hearing was closed to the public and all witnesses had to participate remotely. But that hearing, again, was embraced and named by Ngāti Whātua Tō Muri Te Pōroa Tera A Pōkopoko Whiti Tera. It refers to hope and healing for survivors of abuse and care after years of darkness. We also hold less formal wānanga hui in accordance with tikanga Māori, a whonō and talanoa observing Pacific protocol and other forms of public and private engagement such as round tables, some in person but many by Zoom. Some of our activities are streamed live and remain available in, a, in accessible formats on our website. We consult regularly with the Survivor Advisory Group and with a tomata of senior Māori and expert panels. Commissioners travel to several parts of the country to attend community involvement engagements. As well, we are closely watched and monitored by independently formed groups of experts and survivor networks who have no hesitation in calling us to task. This can be uncomfortable, but it is vital that we remain as close to the voices of survivors as, and engaged experts as we can. And if we put a foot wrong, we need to be told and we need to learn from that. And one of the skills I have had a lot of practice in at this job is to accept valid criticism and apologise where we have gone wrong. Importantly, we have constantly to look for ways to make our processes better and to learn from our mistakes. My aim is to ensure that the hope of survivors are kept alive. One who gave eloquent voice to the hopes of survivors after one of the public hearings said, 
The darkness and shame we have carried has begun to lift in the light of exposing the truth of what we have suffered at the hands of so many for so long. As the Commission is still very much in business and our investigations are ongoing, it's not appropriate for me to speak in any detail about our current work. But what I can say is that in the last, uh, the Commission has over the last four years been through several phases a setup and research phase, and then an investigation phase, which comprised evidence gathering and public hearings. We initially and enthusiastically identified 20 separate inquiries that we could undertake to, that would cover all the terms, settings and the terms of reference. But time and resources do not permit this, and we've consolidated them down to nine investigations. We are very conscious that the Commission has a finite lifespan, no later than June 2023, and a constrained budget with which to conduct all our investigations and reports. So we have now moved into the final analysis and report writing phase. Currently, we are finalising two case studies, one into the Lake Alice Child and Adolescent Unit and one into Maryland School run by the Brothers of St John of God in Christchurch. And work on the final report is well underway. I commend to you the two interim reports that we have already published. They have been to the Governor-General and been tabled. In a report at the end of 2000 called Tafauritia Purongo Tawa, we outlined the inquiry's progress at that stage and our findings. In December 2021, we submitted a substantial report, He Purapura Ora He Māra Tipu, in which we traversed the evidence about the historic redress processes for survivors that I referred to earlier. But in summary, and to date, we have found that much of the abuse suffered at the hand of state and faith-based institutions was criminal, and some of it was torture. Historically, those agencies were not willing to accept the widespread abuse that could easily have been uncovered. The scale of abuse, we believe, was too horrific and the costs were too high for it to be recognised. The agencies convinced themselves that this was not a systemic, widespread problem. The full individual and societal impacts of abuse and neglect will be fully described in later reports. But we have already reported that 80% of current prisoners have spent time in state care, as have similar numbers of mongrel mob and black power gangs. One survivor described how the extreme violence he experienced in boys' homes carved what he called a deep groove in him and was passed on to the people we came into contact with, including our own families. We have already made recommendations for a future redress system and scheme, which are currently before the government for action. The Public Service Minister, Chris Hipkins, and the Minister of Internal Affairs, Jan Tanetti, announced shortly after the release of that report that the government was starting work on a new, independent, survivor-focused redress system to implement the recommendations. On 9 August, uh, just past, Minister Hipkins released a cabinet paper outlining immediate and urgent projects to improve survivors' experiences of seeking redress. And this is another unique aspect of this inquiry the government is working on implementing interim recommendations before the final report has been delivered. And so finally, some personal reflections. I want to finish with my personal reflections on this extraordinary journey I've had over the last four years by repeating what I said at the beginning. This work has affected me profoundly, both personally and professionally. It has opened my eyes to a previously unspoken and shameful history of cruel abuse and neglect of the most vulnerable in our society. 
It has caused me to reflect long and hard on what it truly means to be a responsible citizen of Aotearoa New Zealand. For I am a child of the era when the worst of this was happening. Born in 1947, I was a baby boomer, born into the post-Second World War age. It was a time of prosperity and opportunity. But on the other hand, it was an age of conservative, straight-laced, largely misogynistic thinking that frowned on dissent, that was overtly racist, that actively encouraged eugenics and was informed by ableism. Physical violence in the form of strapping and caning children was sanctioned in both schools and home to maintain discipline. Personally, I was chastised roundly by my family for publicly protesting against the building of the Manapouri Dam. I felt and endured, but could not name at the time, the rigid, rigid sexist stereotypes I as a young girl and woman was locked into. I vividly remember my horror and confusion on hearing people I loved and respected making proud and open racist jibes against Māori or anyone of colour. I remember the jeering at people with any unusual feature or disability and the deep, deep shame attached to anyone who dared to reveal a mental illness, an unwed pregnancy or even poverty. At that time, the norm was that these people needed to be weeded out, sent away, disciplined and made to conform to the ideal Western models that white middle-class people in New Zealand strived for. This was the conservative, hierarchical, colonial New Zealand that favoured correction in institutional care over support for families in need. What I have learned to my horror is that this was fertile ground for the systemic and for the systems and attitudes that enabled and even sanctioned the abuse of our most vulnerable, those for, hope for whom home life did not conform to the ideal, or worse, was violent and abusive. Each one of these young people and children needed to be understood and soothed and loved. Instead, they were being abused by the state and faith-based institutions who thought they could do a better job of parenting. Those who had a mental illness, a physical or learning or neurodisability were generally locked away, out of sight, out of mind, but above all, out of care. This abuse was happening around the corner as I was cycling to school in Christchurch in the 1960s, I have learned that the church I was attending was at least blind to and at worst complicit in the locking up and abusing of children who needed love and care. I have to my shame learned that those of my classmates in a working class school who were Māori, who came without lunch, who were skinny or looked afraid, were most likely being abused by foster parents or the local priest, and no one was watching or protecting. My shame is for my and subsequent generations who, quote, left it to the authorities to manage these misfits. We did not see or hear their calls for help because we trusted those in power to get it right. What we reaped as a society, and what the Royal Commission has reported on so far, was successive generations of impacted, broken people whose care by the state and faith-based institutions often led to involvement with gangs, crime, mental health issues, poverty, prostitution, and our dreadful mental health and prison statistics. It has disempowered and harmed generations of Māori. This is not historic. This is present and real and raw. But I have also learned that those who suffered abuse are true survivors 
whose main aim is for this to never happen again, e kore anō, never again. I have learned that we cannot continue in the same way using the same Western colonial models of care and protection and so-called treatment. I have a vision of other ways of caring that is trauma-informed, mana-enhancing, survivor-focused and underpinned by universal and international human rights principles, not the least of which are enshrined in Te or o Waitangi. To achieve this, the Royal Commission has to tell the stories so that we collectively own them as a nation. And we all have responsibility to look inwards, as individuals, as professionals, as communities, we must ask how and why this happened. And then courageously, we have to champion reform. We must require and encourage our governments, our churches and other institutions to whom we entrust our vulnerable to not only put right the wrongs of the past, but to create new ways of caring that are indigenous to this land, to this people, to us. And that takes me finally to the question I posed about what happens to the reports and recommendations of the Royal Commission. Will they lead to their proper fruits of reforms and improvements in law and practice? It is our task as commissioners to recommend that systems that caused harm change fundamentally so that the horrors and the damage of the past cannot be repeated and that all survivors can have proper pathways to healing. The response to our recommendation lies not only with government and the faith-based institutions, but with each and every one of us. The Royal Commission will end in the middle of next year, but the need for change will remain. And governments will only change systems if we, the people, require and demand it. I'm very grateful to ours for this opportunity to describe the journey of the Royal Commission. Ours are supported in holding this event by the New Zealand Law Foundation and the University of Otago Faculty of Law and the Williams Trust, and I'm grateful to all of them. I warmly acknowledge their participation as it's enabled me uh, to measure the work we are doing against the principles, the values and the work ethic of Ethel Benjamin. I would like to think that she would approve of the work that we are doing to address this catastrophe and that she would have been a loud and effective voice for change. She's a fine ex exemplar of what it meant and continues to mean to be a responsible and caring citizen of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Ko mutu aku kōrero mō tēnē wā, nō reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, ara tēnā rā tātou katoa. Good afternoon everyone. My name's Hayley Galvin and I'm the Deputy Convener for OWLS. Um, and on behalf of OWLS, it is my absolute pleasure to thank you, Justice Coral Shaw, for the insightful address she has given today. We've been fortunate enough to hear the experience of somebody working on the front line of change. It was saddening to hear the long road taken by victims to get to this point uh, and disappointing to hear the roadblocks you've faced on the way. The courage of these survivors and the work that you and your team at the Royal Commission are doing is truly to be commended. I look forward to hearing the recommendations coming out next year and I hope that the public continue to be concerned by the findings of the inquiry until real change is made. It's tradition for ours to present our guest speaker with a special gift. It is a brooch of an owl. <laughs> we were just speaking of this earlier um, and it's made by a local Dunedin uh, goldsmith, Tony Williams. Uh, would you all please join me in thanking Justice Coral Shaw. Can I just say, 
I'm truly delighted because I sat covered looking at this and kept on commenting, saying, what a beautiful thing, what a beautiful thing. I'm truly <laughs> delighted by this. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, I'll also just take a few minutes to, to thank a, um, a few of our sponsors. So we have the, uh, the Law Foundation, the Otago Faculty of Law, the Williams Trust, thank you, and those who have helped organise the event today, uh, Nicola Peart, uh, who is a previous Ethel ben Benjamin address speaker, um, handpicked these flowers from her garden for today, so they're extra special. Um, also thank you to uh, the Dunedin Public Art Gallery for hosting us, his and hers catering, um, the OWLS Committee and Lenore Brady as well. Uh, and finally, thank you everyone who's come here today to support uh, our organisation. Um, so we, I can now conclude the address and I invite you all upstairs to the gallery to enjoy a morning tea. Um, for anyone that can't make it up the stairs or would prefer to use an elevator, if they just um, meet to the side here and I'll be able to direct them of, um, to where the elevator is. Thank you. Oh, I'm so touched. <laughs> <laughs> Truly touched. Um, when you were saying that you were having coffee.